Well, good morning, church. Stand with us. Let's sing about his faithfulness. shadow of the Almighty. You'll be able to say, the Lord is my refuge, my fortress in whom I trust. And verse 4 says, He will cover you. You will find refuge in Him, and in His faithful promises are your armor and your protection. Because I will rest in your promises, my confidence.
Father, we thank you that we can stand in this place and declare that, that you are faithful, faithful forever you will be, so faithful. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you're the Lord our God, ever faithful, never changing through the ages. That your word says in Deuteronomy 7, 9, know therefore the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps his covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Thank you, Lord, for your love and faithfulness. Amen.
Why don't we take one minute, go find somebody you don't know, and tell them we are not alone. We are not alone. Welcome them to Brookstone. All right. Hey, I hope you got to meet somebody new. If you would um, be seated and let me just welcome you this morning. I'm Lonnie Ray. I'm the executive pastor here at the church. And um, it is my privilege and my honor to welcome you here this morning, this cold morning. And man, so excited to see you kind of put on an extra layer and get out here to worship the Lord. Amen. So it's good to see you here. Hey, um, as you came in the service, you were given a bulletin. And there are several things on the bulletin I want to draw your attention to. First of all, there is an announcement there, um, Brookstone Serve. And on February the 2nd and the 3rd, we're going to go down to Merriman Avenue Baptist Church. And um, as a church, we're going to begin uh, as a body. We're going to go down there to help um, do some cleanup, uh, to uh, do some paintings, minor repairs, um, and uh, do some landscaping if the, if the weather works with us. And so all of that's just to sort of revitalize the, the property there. And so we really need uh, your help. And if you can plan to be with us on Friday night uh, from about 6 o'clock or 6.30 to about 9 o'clock that night, or on Saturday morning from about uh, 9 till about 1.00, we could certainly use your help, whether it's just in cleaning alone or coming and helping us work outside or even doing some painting. But we really do have a lot of work to do down there just to kind of help make that a more inviting place. And so if you would consider to come and help us, we need probably about 70 to 100 volunteers to, to make, it, make that work. Um, we would really encourage you to, uh, to participate. All you need to do is on your connection card, there's a tab there. And a box, just check that box, and that'll help you um, communicate with you how, what you need to know. And we'll be in touch with you as we get a little bit closer with that. Then also, there's baptism service coming up on February the 4th. Now, this will be our first baptism service here in this facility. So it's going to be an exciting day. If you have not been baptized or just recently come to know the Lord as your Savior and you're in need of being baptized, we would love to be able to do that with you and for you. And that's going to be an exciting day for us. So if you would, on your connection card as well, just check that box for baptism and we'll get back in touch with you and keep you um, kind of up to uh, in the loop as, as what's happening and what you need to know uh, as far as baptism service. Then also, I just want to encourage you that there's uh, the connection card, which is perforated there, and you can kind of rip that off and sometime during this service and fill that information out. For those of you who are regular attenders, you know we love for you to do that so we can get your record of uh, just worship this morning. But for those of you who may be visiting with us and our guests, we want to encourage you to do that as well. Uh, that way we can communicate with you and stay in touch with you and just kind of let you know what's happening here at the church. So you, all you need to do is fill that out, put it in the offering plate at the end of the service, and that would be a great blessing to us and a great help to you as well. Hey, we are going to continue our worship time this morning, and uh, we want to encourage you just to stay seated just for a minute. And as we are working through this song, this is a song we want to encourage you to be sort of reflective. Um, this, the, the title of the song is King of My Heart. And so this morning, I just want to challenge you and ask you, is he the king of your heart? And as you consider him the king of your heart, to know that he is a good, good father. Scripture really declares that, isn't it? That he is a good father. He is a father of gifts and he so desires to bless us. And so this morning, if you would just focus on the goodness of the Lord Jesus. Thank you. 
ready to step out of your row and into a circle because you want to pursue healthy relationships and spiritual growth. It's time to go to GroupLink. There's something about meeting people face to face, making that initial connection that makes group the place where people can experience accountability, belonging, and care, where people can connect and grow. That's why there's GroupLink, an event where you'll meet people in your stage of life and area of town, form a group, and get to know each other a little bit. There's only two things you need to know when you show up. What area of town you'd like your group to meet in and which nights of the week you're available. From the time you show up to the time you leave, there will be a team of staff and volunteers to walk you through every step of the night. If you want us to, we'll even break the ice and help you make some connections. The only thing you need to do is come ready to introduce yourself to some new people. If this makes you a little uncomfortable, just remember, everybody at GroupLink is there doing the same thing. One more note, trust God. He's the one who forms the groups. You never know who he may want to use to grow you or who he may want to grow through your influence. Come to GroupLink and join a group. Life is better connected. Well, if you believe life is better connected, would you shout amen? Amen. Amen. It really, really is. And I want to follow up that little video encouragement uh, to you to say uh, this is the year, 2018, is the year of intentional discipleship. We are committed to growing together deep in our walk with the Lord and our spiritual maturity and in our fellowship, our community as a church family. And it is impossible for that to really happen as it ought to simply on a Sunday morning. How many times have we said this? Rows are good, right? We ought to sit in rows. That's important. But circles are better. And so we want to help you find a circle. We want to get you connected in a, uh, in a life group. And so that event is coming up to help you do this group link next Sunday night on the 21st. Your bulletin is covered with information about that today. And you can register for group link uh, there on the connection card before you drop that in the offering plate. Uh, I was asked to let you know that uh, we are giving away two tickets to the Shonda Pierce 
uh, event that's coming up in February. Uh, you can be a part of that event if you say, I wanted a ticket and I couldn't get one because they're sold out. I've been watching online. These things are a hot item. People are trying to buy them like crazy. I think we could probably scalp them and pay off the building on, on the, out on the sidewalk that night. But it is, uh, it's going to be a great event. And if you're looking for a ticket, I mean, I don't want to twist your arm, you know, kind of bribe you to come to Group Link. But if you want a ticket, you might get one. They're going to give away a couple of VIP tickets that night. Hey, would you join me again in telling Emily Pettit what a great job she did in ministering to us this morning in that beautiful song? Praise God. I'm so proud of Emily. And, uh, you know, uh, many of you uh, might know Emily already. She grew up in our church family. Emily's parents came to faith in Jesus when she and her twin brother, Taylor, uh, were just babies. Uh, In fact, I've told this story before. I remember her dad, John coming uh, forward in one of our services and kneeling uh, in the altar and trusting Christ as his Savior with Taylor, Emily's twin brother, uh, in his arms as just a baby. This was uh, upwards of 20 years ago, 19 or 20 years ago. And they, John and Kelly, have raised their, their kids in our church family. They went to our Christian school, uh, their entire um, you know, K through 12. And now Emily is a second-year student at Liberty University and studying for worship leadership. And I'm so proud of her and what God is doing in her life. And uh, the Lord used her to encourage us this morning. I also want to encourage you to be in prayer for a guy in our church by the name of Daniel Edwards. Many of you know Daniel. He's been a part of our church for a number of years, and he's currently out of the country. Um, He's headed, I should say, back out of the country. He's been in for a few weeks, but he's headed back out of the country. He's in uh, missionary training at an organization called Radius down in Tijuana, And uh, he is preparing to go to serve the Lord in uh, the most populous Muslim nation in the world, Indonesia, a nation of, I think, 14,000 islands. And uh, Daniel is going there to serve the Lord and to preach the gospel and to uh, plant a church. And we are so grateful uh, for that ministry that God is giving him. Well, it's good to be a part of this church family, God raising up people and sending them out to serve the Lord. Let's pray together. We're going to jump right into God's Word. Father, thank you for the privilege that is ours to be in this place today to sing and celebrate the fact that you are good. We're grateful, Lord, that your mercies are new every single morning. And we gather here today in the assurance of the goodness of God. And uh, Lord, I know that we've come here, some of us really maybe knowing and having experienced uh, the goodness of God and others of us Maybe a little less cognizant of your goodness. Maybe some even doubting your goodness today because of the struggles or difficulties, hardships or grieving in their lives. Lord, none of those things change the fact of your character. You are good. It's not that you just act good. You are good. It's who you are. And we know that and we want to learn it more fully uh, for having been here today. So meet every one of us at the point of our need. God, speak to us with clarity And I pray, God, that you will be honored during this time together, and we will give you the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said out loud together, amen. Amen. Why don't you take your Bibles and turn with me today to the book of Ephesians, and we're going to chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter 5, and I'm glad that you've come today. Uh, I know it's a cold, cold, bitter morning, a little snow blowing around last night and, and uh, even early this morning, so thank you for weathering it. Uh, if you think you were a little chilly coming to church, uh, you need to be thankful for all those parking guys and gals who were directing traffic this morning, standing out there for an hour uh, in that cold weather, and uh, uh, we're grateful for them and their ministry. But thank you. Uh, Thank you for being here today. Let me ask you a question as we're getting started. Uh, By the show of your hands, how many of you remember when you were a kid uh, playing a game often at birthday parties called pin the tail on the donkey? If you ever played the game, look around. Almost everybody in the room played pin the tail on the donkey. Now tell me in what world this is a good idea that you take about 36-year-olds and you cram them into a tight space, you put a blindfold on one of them, spin him in circles, and then put a thumbtack in his hand and challenge him to go find where he should stick (laughs) that thumbtack. In most scenarios, that's not going to work out well. 
In what other arena of life would we say, that's a good idea? Let's put a blindfold on someone and spin them around. Think simply about the world of games or competitive sports. We would never consider doing this in competitive sports. Think about it. If you have a favorite football team, every time that football team steps up to the line of scrimmage, you expect that with purpose and focus and execution, they will move the ball forward on purpose toward the goal line. And if you ever watched your favorite quarterback step up under center and now turn and spin around and around and around, close his eyes and run a play blindly, you would say, fire that guy. We need another quarterback. If you ever watched a bowler, I don't, I don't do a lot of bowling, but I know bowling balls are heavy. I would be in, uh, concerned if I was in this lane or at this lane bowling and the person in the lane next to me got that, what is a bowling ball? I don't know, 12 or 15 pounds, took a bowling ball, put on a blindfold, spun around and then tried to, I would get out of the way. Because what we expect when we go to the bowling alley is that we roll the ball down the lane toward the pins. Think, think about golf. Every golf stroke is directed intentionally, purposely toward the green, toward the pin, toward the hole. Here's the fact. In competitive sports, we value intention. We value execution. We value purposefulness. And if that's true in games, how much more should it be true in life? I want to welcome you to the beginning of a brand new teaching series. It's going to last us all the way through the beginning weeks of March. About eight weeks, we're going to be thinking together about life on purpose. Some of you may be here today because a friend invited you to come and learn about living life with intentionality, living life on purpose. And I hope that whether you're a first-time guest or a long-time member or a regular attender, that you are going to make a commitment today, a purposeful, intentional commitment, that you will be present and engaged over these next seven weeks or eight weeks. Because what we're going to do in this time together is we're going to learn to live with intentionality in the areas of life that matter the most. Now, let me tell you three of the areas that we're going to talk about. And this is not an exhaustive list, but these are some of the ones that are the most impacting in our lives. Jot them down. These are the things we will cover. Number one, we will spend some time talking about intentionality in our spiritual life. Now, this begins with the point of salvation. The Bible says we ought to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. We need to make our calling and our election sure. We need to know for certain with intentionality and with purpose we should know that we know Christ. But then once we know Jesus, we need to be purposeful in our spiritual development. Very often, this is where we fail as Christ followers. We know Jesus, but then we, we get very lackadaisical or very unintentional about making sure that we're developing, maturing spiritually. I want to talk to you over these weeks about living on mission, making sure that we're being purposeful about living on mission. We're going to talk about our spiritual life. Another thing that we're going to talk about in these weeks together is our relational life or our relationships. We need to be purposeful in those relationships in life that are vital uh, to us. That would be our marriages. If we're married, we need to learn to be purposeful in how we relate to our spouse. Uh, Husbands need to learn intentionality in what it means to be a husband. Wives need to learn intentionality in how to to, uh, be a wife that God has designed. Of course, some of us in this room, even many of us, are not married. So we need to understand what relationships look like for us, maybe dating relationships, and and we'll talk about uh, that. We're going to talk about parenting. If you're raising children or you're influencing grandchildren, we need to talk about being intentional or purposeful uh, parents, not perfect parents. There are none of those, but intentional and purposeful in our parenting. What are our parenting strategies and priorities and values. 
And another area we'll talk about over these weeks is our finances, uh, the money and the possessions that we have. You know, we live every day, every single day of our lives. We deal with, we manage resources and, and, and income and outflow and debt management and, and savings and generosity. And all of these are vital to our spiritual uh, lives and our joy and our effectiveness in this life. We'll talk about living with margin and how it is that we can manage those things well. So those are a few of the areas. Spirit life, relationship life, financial life. These are some of the areas that we'll talk about in these weeks together, and they are vital to every single one of us. Now today, what I want to do is just introduce the idea. So we're not going to get into any of those particulars today. We'll do that in the next seven weeks. But today, I want to introduce this biblical concept of intentionality uh, to you. So you've opened your Bibles to Ephesians chapter number 5. Let me just begin by familiarizing you with the book. Now, by the way, if you didn't bring a Bible with you today, I hope you'll look on with somebody that's sitting next to you. If you don't have a Bible, uh, if you're new to uh, the Scriptures, you say, I need a copy of this, we've got some for you. They're available out in our gathering areas. Just take one off a coffee table. Uh, if they get gone before you get there, go to the coffee shop and they'll, they'll make sure that you get one. We want to make sure you have a copy of the Bible. But in Ephesians chapter number 5, we're going to find our text. But before we read that, I want you to turn back one page to Ephesians chapter 1. And let me familiarize you with the book itself. So Ephesians chapter 1 says that this book is a letter from Paul, who is an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. So in verse number 1, what you immediately learn is when I turn in my Bible to Ephesians chapter 5, I am not simply reading a book of the Bible, I am reading a letter, a letter that was written by an apostle of the Lord to a church which gathered in a city known as Ephesus. Now, the city of Ephesus uh, was a place where Paul preached, the Bible says in Acts 19, for three years. In fact, um, I believe this is true. In fact, I'm confident that this is true, that Paul spent more time in Ephesus building that particular church than any of the other churches that he planted throughout the Roman world. Paul spent three years in this city building a strong and a vibrant church. And Ephesus needed a strong and a vibrant church. Ephesus was a city that was located on the what would be the western shore of modern-day Turkey. It wasn't called Turkey in Paul's day. It was Asia Minor in Paul's day. So if you know geography, think about your your, uh, global or your world geography. Uh, You have uh, Europe, uh, west, uh, or I should say east of us, you've got Europe, and then Asia to the east beyond that. And Asia Minor, or modern-day Turkey, is that westernmost peninsula that reaches from Asia over almost touching Europe. It's right on the, on the tip of that peninsula, modern-day Turkey, where the port city of Ephesus was located. This was a place where every traveler in Paul's day who was traveling from, from Europe to the east, to the Orient, would make landfall, for the most part, in Ephesus. It was a great port city. It was a bustling place, a quarter of a million Uh, People populated that city in the first century in Paul's day. And that city was called the first and the greatest metropolis of the east. It was like modern day St. Louis, the gateway to the west. Well, uh, Ephesus was the gateway to the east or the gateway to Asia. Now, as a large populous city like that, Ephesus was also a place that was filled with uh, different ideas and beliefs and religions. Uh, There was a great theater in Ephesus where they would gather together and worship in that place. Not only would they do secular business and have sporting events, but they would also worship there. In Ephesus, there was the great goddess of Diana. The theater was so large, it was like Fenway Park in Boston. It would hold upwards of 30,000 people. This is a large city 
with a large population, with a multicultural melting pot of, of uh, people who have come from all sorts of cultures, with all sorts of beliefs and all sorts of values, and they melted together in Ephesus. And Paul went there and he preached the gospel of Jesus and he built a church. And when he left them, he wrote a letter back to them. And that letter is the book of Ephesians. And in this letter, he writes to these people that he loves and he challenges them. And it's a strong challenge. Let's read it. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse number 15. Listen to this strong challenge. He says in verse 15, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, do not be unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. I love this in verse number 15 when he says, see to it then. <laughs> he writes back almost as a parent, right? As, a, as the founding pastor and the, and the apostle who can speak to them with authority. And he says, see to it. See to it then that you live circumspectly. That you live intentionally that you live on purpose. I want us to receive Paul's challenge today. We're going to talk about what it means to live a life on purpose. Jot this down if you will. Paul teaches them what it is that defines a life on purpose. Here's my challenge to you today. The same as Paul's challenge, live on purpose. In the world that you don't live in Ephesus, but you live in Asheville or Weaverville, Buncom County, Madison, Yancey County, you live in Western North Carolina, and in this community, here's the challenge, live on purpose. Live with intentionality. And here's what I believe. Every one of us want to do this. We do. I believe that every person in this room would say, I, I don't want to live carelessly, I want to live intentionally. I mean, when you compare those two, who would say, yeah, no, forget that intentionality stuff. I'd just as soon be completely careless in the way I live. Nobody would say that's what I want. I believe we all want to be marked by diligence, not disregard, by commitment, by not, uh, not by unfaithfulness. But here's the truth. Having good intentions and living intentionally, would you agree? It's two separate things, right? Someone once said that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And many of us go through life full of good intentions without ever turning those intentions into intentionality. We just kind of end up where we end up in life. And it's not necessarily that we intended to end up there financially, or it's not necessarily true that we intended to end up there relationally. Or it's not necessarily true that we intended to be where we are spiritually. We had better intentions than that. We just failed to turn those intentions, those good intentions, into intentionality. And oftentimes what we do, because we don't like to admit it when we've made mistakes or we've lived uh, lower than we should, we call where we are success, though we would have never planned to be where we are. It's rather like the guy, the kid who, who uh, takes his bow and arrow in the backyard and he pulls the string back and fires the arrow wildly and randomly into the side of the wooden fence. And then before his father comes out to check his archery skills, he runs up to the fence and draws a bullseye around the arrow. That's the way we live sometimes. We say, oh yeah, this is good, right? Even though it's really not what we would have chosen. And we ended up there because we were unintentional or we failed to be intentional. See, the fact is God has called us to something higher than that. He's called us to something better than that. That we don't have to go through life faking it or settling for less than the targeted outcome. And we need to hear Paul's command to these Ephesians, let it be his command to us, that we would live with intentionality. So what is a life on purpose? What defines a life on purpose? Write it down. Paul says, first of all, that a life on purpose is a life of careful attention. Look at verse number 15, a life of careful attention. He says, see then that you walk circumspectly 
It's a great word. It's a, it's a King James word. It's an, 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 an archaic word even. If you have a more modern translation of the Bible, it simply says walk carefully. Be careful about how you walk. Now, you understand, of course, that when the Bible uses the word walk, it's not talking about one foot in front of the other in terms of the action of stepping. It's talking about the word walk means the conduct with which you live, right? It's, it's the way that you live or the way that you conduct your life, how you go through today and into tomorrow and looking forward to next week and next month and next year. He says, as you're conducting your life, be sure that you are conducting your life in a way that is careful, that is circumspect. And the word circumspect means to pay careful attention. If I were to walk along the side of this platform, then I would have to be very careful. Now, if I get back here, I can be a little more careless where I step because I'm not going to fall as long as I'm back here. But the minute I step to this point, y'all pray for me because I have to suddenly be very careful careful. This is the idea that when you walk, Paul says, when you're going through life, be very attentive to the way that you step. Be very intentional in the decisions that you make. Listen, be very purposeful in the words that you speak. Be very intentional in the paths that you choose. Because if you are foolish in the way that you walk, it will lead you down the wrong path. This is why he goes on to say in verse number 15, see then that you walk circumspectly or carefully. Do not walk or live as a fool, but as wise. Don't live mindlessly or carelessly. That's what foolish means, to live carelessly. Now, when the Bible talks about living with this careful attention, it contrasts circumspect, careful, intentional living with Foolish, faultless living. Now, what does the Bible say about a fool? Proverbs 22, verse number 3. Listen, listen to what the Bible says about that. Let me just read it to you. It says, the wise man foresees evil. A wise man looks down the path and acts accordingly. But the simple or the foolish person passes on, keeps going, and is punished. The contrast in Proverbs 22 is this, that the foolish person just goes through life lackadaisically and they have no real determination of where they will end up because they're just, you know, like I used to say about our little dog that went to heaven a few years ago, a few months ago after 15 years with us, Charlie, she would just go through life like lopey, 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 lopey. She didn't care. She didn't pay attention to anything. She was just happy-go-lucky. Don't go through life like that, but go through life intentionally, wisely looking down the path. See, the Bible says that when we are foolish, then we have disregarded what the Bible says about uh, God and his commands to us. We should be careful, circumspect, not careless. The careless person says, I don't know what happened. I don't know how I ended up here. I didn't see that coming. I, I never thought that's carelessness. But the circumspect person says, I know the steps that I've taken. A life of intentionality, a life of purpose is a life of careful, thoughtful, wise attention. Secondly, Paul would teach us that a life of purpose is a life that is aware of the time or of time and of the times. A life that is aware of time and of the times. Look at verse 16. He says, you should walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Here's what that looks like, verse 16. Redeeming the time. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. The word redeeming means to, to secure, to buy back. Another way to say it is to make the most of your time. Can I get a witness from somebody in the room? Once you get to be 40, 45, 50 years old, you realize that life is passing like that. Amen? Life is short. And it's too short to waste. It's too short to live carelessly. It passes so quickly. Job, over and over in the book of Job, reminds us how brief this life is. He says, it's swifter than a weaver's shuttle. 
a modern translation of that might be a sewing machine. You imagine that little, that little needle going up and down on a sewing machine. That's, that's how fast your life is. Faster than a weaver shuttle going back and forth. It's like a shadow that's only here and then it flees away. It's brief. And I need to tell you that one day too soon, our lives will be over. And we should have lived those few days on this earth with care and attention. He says that we understand that we need to redeem the time because it's brief. But not only because it's brief, but because the days are evil. The life that lives on purpose understands I don't have a lot of days to live. But it also understands that the days in which I do live, they're evil days. And that sin is sweeping through the land. And and the culture is dragging clueless and careless people down into the cesspool. And if I am going to live in a way that is intentional. I must be aware that I'm living in evil days and those days will pass all too quickly. That's the second thing that defines a life that is intentional, one that's careful, careful attention, and then one that understands these brief days and what they're like. The third thing he says in verse 17 is that a life on purpose is a life that seeks to please God. You'll notice this in verse 17 when he says, wherefore be not unwise but rather live, live your days, live with careful intentionality, understanding the days, as you understand what the will of the Lord is. We talk about a life that seeks to please God. We're talking about a life that seeks to understand the desire or the will of God. Psalm 14 verse 1 says, you may not know the reference, you'll know the verse immediately, The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. It is the foolish person who says, I will live with a disregard for the ways or the will or the even the existence of God. Now to say there is no God doesn't only uh, convey the idea that there's an atheistic attitude, like I don't believe God exists, but to say there is no God is to say there is no God in my life. That there is no God that directs and controls my life. I will do what I want to do because I am my own God. No. He says in verse number 17, this is how you live purposefully. You consider, you understand what is the will of the Lord. It's an interesting word, this word understand. Here's what it means. It doesn't just mean to mentally get it. Listen carefully. It means to put together or to synthesize the will of God and the ways of my life. Now listen, if y'all are still with me, say amen. Paul says, I want you to see to it in this world, in this culture, that you live carefully, intentionally, with purpose, that you you live a life where you understand you only have a few days in a broken world, and in those few days, you should synthesize your behavior, your choices, your priorities, your relationships, your finances, your parenting, your spiritual walk, synthesize all of that with the will of God. Understand what the will of God is. And how do I do so? Well, I know the will of God clearly through the Word of God. How many times have I said this to y'all? Y'all know this to be true, that if I want to know the will of God, I must know the Word of God. How many times did Jesus say in his ministry to people who were making foolish statements and, and living in mistaken ways, he would say, what? Don't you know? Have you not read? The Bible explains to me the will of God for my spiritual life. The Bible instructs me about my marriage responsibilities. Are you with me? The Bible tells me God's will for how I handle the money he entrusts to me. The Bible explains to me the will of God. And if I want to live a careful, attentive, purposeful life for just a few days in an evil world, I need to know his will and then bring my ways in alignment with his will. So understand with me that a life on purpose is a life of careful, daily surrender to the will of God where we live for his pleasure and the way that we relate to him and the way that we relate to our 
community and the way that we relate to our church and the way that we relate to our spouse and the way that we relate to our kids and our siblings, the way that we carry ourselves on the job and the way that we manage our finances, all of these things are to be brought under the authority and the will of God. And you may hear that and say, okay, I understand now. I now get where we're going, that this idea of life purpose is not driven by secular thinking or simply uh, worldly ideas, but it is a, divine, a divinely directed life that God is calling me to. And some of you may be thinking right now, well, this is the first Sunday. Let's be honest with you, Pastor, that sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm up for that for the next seven weeks. Well, I hope you are. But I will agree with you, it does sound like a lot of work. So we have to answer the second question, and it's a really important question. And Paul makes it clear in this passage, let's talk about what, or here's a better way to say it, who empowers a life on purpose. If I want to live a life on purpose for these few days in this fallen world, to the glory of God, for His, by His power, how is that going to happen. Notice I said not what empowers a life on purpose, but who empowers a life on purpose. I, I believe it's true. that Some of you, maybe many of you, I hope all of you would say, Pastor, I, I want to live this way. I do. I want my marriage to be in alignment with God's will and His Word. I want my finances to be, and I want my relationships to be, and I want my spiritual journey to be. I really do. I, I want to live this way, but the question is how, how can I do it? Here's the simple answer. If you're listening, say amen. amen. Relinquish control. And I want to say it again. Relinquish control of your life. Notice what the Bible says in verse number 18. Immediately following these verses where he says, verse 15, See that you walk circumspectly. Don't be foolish in this world. Be wise. You only have a few days in an evil world. So know the will of God and live your life according to that. And here's how you do it, verse 18. Do not be drunk with wine, for in success, but be filled with the Spirit. And you might think that seems like a, an interesting turn in the text. He's simply talking generally about how our lives should be ordered by the will of God. And then he says, do not be drunk with wine. Well, if you agree, it's a good idea to not be drunk with wine. Say amen. Yeah, shouldn't do that. But here's the issue. That drunkenness with alcohol is, at the end of the day, an issue of control. When someone is drunk, they have yielded the control of their faculties, the control of their thinking and their, and their speaking, the control of their their bodily actions, they have yielded it to the control of the substance in their bloodstream. All of us are controlled by something. What controls you? Maybe it's not alcohol. I hope it's not. If it is, there's freedom from that. But some of us in this room are controlled by greed. Every decision you make, every priority you set, everything that, every way that you determine that you will interact with the world, Every, it has to do with how you relate to your family. It has to do with your generosity and managing of resources. It's all driven by one thing, the desire for more, the greed to have more. As surely as alcohol controls a drunk, greed controls men and women. For some of us, it's not greed. Maybe it's lust. There are some who because of lust, driving, attitudes, actions, words, thinking, they have not had relationships that are in alignment with God's Word. They have not related to their spouse in a way that is not in alignment with God's Word. They have wasted their substance on things that satisfy their lusts rather than living in that regard with careful attention and purpose. Some of us are controlled by pride. Every word we speak is carefully measured to make sure that the outcome of that conversation puts us in the best light. Every step that we take is, is carefully, even connivingly considered so that we might be the one that is elevated in that. And pride drives and controls us. For others, it's fear. 
Fear of man, fear of what people will think, afraid to do what I should do because I'm afraid of the results or of what people will think of me. Do you understand that he says, do not be controlled by alcohol, and I would add, do not be controlled by pride, do not be controlled by greed, do not be controlled by lust, do not be controlled by anything except this, the Holy Spirit of God. Are you understanding? Be filled with the Spirit And I've told you over and over, you know this, that the word filled in this passage is a nautical term. It doesn't mean filled from the bottom to the top. It's not like a glass, like you're a quarter of the way filled or halfway filled or three quarters. You can't say, I am seven-eighths full of the Holy Spirit. It's not full from the bottom to the top. It is full through and through. It's a nautical term, which is the idea that when you have a sailboat and the sail on the mast is hanging limp when there's no wind, the minute the wind comes up and it pops that sail out and you hear that poof of the sail and immediately the boat begins to move under the power of the wind. He says, do not be controlled by fear or lust or pride or alcohol, but be controlled and moved by the Holy Spirit of God. He is the one that empowers This kind of life. And you should know that the Holy Spirit is the promise of Jesus Christ to every single believer in Christ. Is this what Jesus said in John chapter 16 verse 7? He said, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go away, the comforter will come. The Holy Spirit is the promise of Christ to every believer. Pastor, how can I be intentional? You can be intentional. You can live with purpose. You can live with intentionality when the Spirit of God is controlling your life. Amen? When the Spirit of God is making the difference. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, What do you not know that your body, your earthly body, your body of flesh is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Here's what I want you to know. That it is impossible... For an unbeliever, a Christ-rejecting person to live a life of full intentionality in alignment with the Word and the will of God, it is not difficult, it is impossible. Because only the Holy Spirit can empower this kind of life and the Holy Spirit dwells in those who have given their lives to Jesus. And so if you have never come to faith in Christ, it begins with this surrender to Jesus. Come to Christ and surrender to His Spirit. And live with intentionality. And so an intentional life, a life on purpose, is one where we live with careful attention. Where we understand that we only have a few days in a broken world. And that God has outlined for us how that we are to live in our relationships, in our spiritual walk, in our community, in our church, in our our marriages, our families, with our money. In all these areas that God has aligned and told us how to live. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, He equips us to do it. There's one last thing I need to tell you out of this passage in Ephesians 5. If you're okay for a few more minutes, say amen. Amen. So what what defines a life on purpose? We've learned. Who empowers a life on purpose? It's the Holy Spirit. Here's the question. You may be asking the question, why do I care? Why should I really be motivated by this? Write it down. Let's end by talking about what motivates a life on purpose. Why should you leave here today really even caring about this? Why does it really matter? Now, you might say, and it would be a logical uh, response to that, you might say, well, I want to be intentional in my marriage because if I'm purposeful in my marriage, then makes sense we'll have a better marriage and if we have a better marriage because we're intentional in in our relationship then we're going to be happier there's my motivation I I want to be in I want to be an intentional husband so that I'll be a happier husband that might be what you say it's not a bad motive to want to be happy nothing wrong with that you might say well I, I want to be a good parent because I want my kids to be healthy. I want them to grow up well balanced and, you know, uh, uh, kind of uh, living a life where they've had good training uh, as as they were growing up. It'll it'll promote family harmony, and and that's what I want. So I want to be an intentional parent. That's a good thing. You might say, "I, I want to be intentional in my spiritual life 
I, I want to develop spiritually. I want to be on purpose in my spiritual life because if I do that, God will bless me, right? And if God blesses me, it's a blessed life. And I, I like blessing. And so I want to be intentional in my spiritual life so God will bless me. Maybe you say, I want to be intentional in my finances because obviously if I'm intentional in my finances, then I'm going to have more financial freedom. And financial freedom is good and, and that's what I want. Here's what I want to tell you. That 33 years of pastoral ministry and about almost 40 years of knowing Jesus have taught me that those reasons that I've just delineated are not enough. They're not. And they will not keep you purposeful when the rubber meets the road. When life really gets difficult, they will fail you in an evil world. You see, there's really only one thing at the end of the day that will motivate us to live a purposeful, careful, attentive, intentional life. And this is found in the context of the passage that we've just read. Now, we began in verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, live purposefully, not as a fool, but as a wise person, understanding you only have a few days in this world, and it's an evil world at that. Do not be controlled by anything, but let the Spirit of God empower you to live a life in alignment with God's word. That's what and how. But the why is answered above it. In fact, you'll see this, a hint about this in verse 15 when he says, see then, see then, as a result of what I've been saying, see to it then that you live this kind of life. So what motivates this kind of life? Well, the answer to the question relates back to what we talked about Last Sunday, if you were here last Sunday, you know we talked about the fact that we are to be the church that Jesus came to build. And one of the things we learned last week was that Jesus has called his church out of the world, out of darkness. Remember we talked a lot about darkness, being called out of darkness to be children of the light. Well, I want you to go back up to verse number 8, Ephesians 5 and verse number 8. Listen to what it says. Before you were called to be a part of the church, before you were adopted into God's family by grace and through faith in Jesus, at that time, you were darkness. You were in the darkness of the world. Now, y'all are listening very attentively this morning, and I'm grateful for that, but sometimes I can't tell if you're taking it all in or if you're taking a nap. So if you're with me, say amen. If you once were in darkness, would you shout Amen. Amen. Not that you're glad about it, it's just the fact. We were in darkness. So he says in verse number 8, you were at one time in darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. Praise God. We were in darkness. He says we have been called as part of the church into the light of the Lord. Look at the end of verse number 8. Walk as children of the light. Conduct yourself in this world as children of the light. Live on purpose as a person who's living in the light. Look at verse 9. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. And the person walking in the power of the Spirit, experiencing the fruit of the Spirit giving them a life which is marked by goodness and a life marked by righteousness and a life marked by truth, verse 10 says, this kind of life demonstrates or proves what is acceptable unto the Lord or what pleases the Lord. So you remember, he said down in verse 15, 16, and 17, live circumspectly so that you will know, understand, and bring to 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 bring your life in alignment with what pleases the Lord. He says, well, you once were in darkness, now you've been brought to light. The fruit of the Spirit within you produces goodness, righteousness, and truth, which demonstrates that life that is pleasing to the Lord. Verse 11, verse 11 and 12, he says, so don't revert back to that former way of living. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful, worthless, useless works of darkness. Now, I I could stop and preach right here for a minute. That as a follower of Jesus, if I want to live a life that is in alignment with his word and that pleases him, it will be a life in the power of the spirit which represents the light or demonstrates or displays the light 
that I have been brought into, it will be marked not by perfection, because none of us are, but it will be marked by a growing righteousness, a deepening goodness, and a deepening truthfulness or verity or faithfulness in my life. This is what the Spirit of God produces. If I live with intentionality so that this can be the case, if I don't live with intentionality, what will happen? I will revert back to the darkness. doesn't mean I lose my salvation, but the tendency of my flesh is to go back to the darkness, right? He says in verses 11 and 12, don't go back to that. Don't have fellowship with those unfruitful works of darkness, but rather... Rather than living like the darkness that you were drawn from, live in the light on purpose. And then your life, not only will it not go back to darkness, it will reprove the darkness. Look at verse number 12. But rather, verse 11 rather, but rather reprove them. For it's a shame to even speak of those things which are done of them in secret. He says, not only should I not go back and live that life, it's a shame to even talk about those things. That way I used to live ought to be something. I don't even talk about that. I've been redeemed from that. He says, don't go back and live that way. Rather than going and living that way, verse number 13, he says, you should reprove reprove that darkness, verse 11. Verse 13 says, but all things that are reproved. In other words, the darkness that is reproved is made manifest by the light. For whatsoever makes manifest or whatever illuminates the darkness is light. He says, if you you walk back, if you live in this world as a child of the light, then you will reprove the darkness by your very life. Now, if you all still with me, say amen. Don't miss this. Verse number 14. Wherefore, he says, awake. Wake up. This is the command of Paul. Wake up. Arise. It means stir yourself. You live in a dark world of sin. Evil days abound. You have a limited number of days to live in this world. God called you out of darkness, made you his child, put the light of life within you, and left you in this evil world for a few days so that you could shine light in the darkness that you have been delivered from. So wake up! Be intentional! Arise! And Christ will give you light. And the light of your life, the light of your intentional, purposeful life, surrendered to the power of the Holy Spirit, that intentional, purposeful life coming into alignment with the will and the ways of God will cause your light. Are you listening? Your lighted life to suddenly drive back darkness and reprove dark works and send forth the light that has become the mark of your life. If you want to be intentional in your marriage because it will make you happy, that won't serve you enough. That won't carry you all the way through. But if you want to be intentional in your marriage... Because your marriage ultimately shines light in the power of Christ into a dark world. That will keep you on focus. If the motivation, listen to me. If the motivation for how you raise your children is that you want your children to always make you look good, that's not enough. But if you will motivate, if you'll be motivated by this, the way I raise my kids has an impact on the light of the gospel in this world. It reflects the light of Jesus Christ. That will keep you intentional. You with me? 
If you say, I want to I wanna manage the resources that God gives me, I want to steward this money and these possessions, I, I want to live with generosity, and I want to be wise in the way I, I handle money, not so that I can have more, I do more, travel more, but so that my stewardship of what God gives me reflects well on the glory and the grace of Jesus. That'll make you a good steward and nothing else will. If it all comes back down to you, then it's not enough. But if it comes down to, how does this reflect on my Lord? How does this illuminate this dark world with the light of my glorious Jesus? If that's your motivation, then you can live from now until the day that you die not perfectly, but in the power of the Holy Spirit of God on purpose in every area of your life. Your vision has to change. The problem with so much Christendom in the 21st century, the problem with so many churches and the problem with so many Christians is that we have come to believe that Jesus exists to make my life better and he gets up every day to see how he can bless me and here's what the Bible says you get up every day because you have been called from the deep dark sulfurous depths of eternal damnation and given the light of the gospel now wake up and live for Jesus in this world that's the motivation for purposeful living And my prayer for you and my prayer for me as a husband and as a father and as a grandfather and as a Christian and as a member of Brookstone Church and as the pastor of this church and as the leader of our staff, my prayer for me and my prayer for you is that every day of my life by the power of the Holy Spirit till I draw my last breath, I will live on purpose for the light of his glory. I hope you will too. Let's pray together. Father, would you give us grace to live this way? God, would you give us grace to be people of the light? Not because it's good for us, but because it's glorifying of you. Because you, Lord, have called us out of darkness. You have given us a life of light. And we are to shine that light. Help us, God, to shine in the way that we engage in our marriage. If we're not married, help us to shine that light in the way that we relate to members of the opposite sex, single students, single adults, single again adults, and how we date and how we relate what we do with our bodies. God, let us walk in the light. God, what we we do with regard to our children and our grandchildren, our parenting and our grandparenting and how we train them up, not for us, at the end of the day, not even for them, but for you and your glory. God, how we manage our stuff for your glory, how we speak truth, how we live with honesty and transparency. For your glory. How we relate to our church. How we serve. and How we love each other. For your glory. Oh Christ, be our vision. Oh Christ, be our light. That we might live on purpose. We will give you the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed all over this room. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor, man, I need this. I'm married and I need this in my marriage. I'm raising kids and I'm struggling and they're struggling and I need to know how to respond. I'm struggling to know how to manage the stuff God gives me. Pastor, pray for me. I want to be on purpose. Would you slip your hand up? Pray for me, Pastor. Amen. Amen.
Amen. God, give us grace. Jesus, be our vision. And we pray this for your glory. Amen and amen. Hey, church, I love you. And I believe God's going to transform our lives in some radical ways over these next seven weeks. I'm, I'm praying that you're going to be here. You're going to bring people with you. There's cards in the vestibules again today. So you can take out these invitation cards and give them out. We're mailing out a mailer this week to invite our community to come. We want to live on purpose. And I want you to be a part of that. So don't miss these next few weeks. Let's grow together. Would you stand to your feet? Our ushers are going to come. This altar, as always, is open to you if you need to come. Let's end our time together singing, Be Thou My Vision. Let's worship together. Be Thou My Vision, O Lord. My name is Jeff Atkins, and I have the pleasure of being the children's pastor here at Brookstone, and it is a privilege. You guys have invested in one of the most credible churches. Isn't this a beautiful place? Now, there's a place you guys don't get to see that often. It's the children's areas, and let me just tell you, it's amazing. And I just thank you for your investment in this church. We have the most wonderful place to do ministry to children. So please help us spread the word. If you've got some friends and neighbors that aren't plugged into a church, and they got kids... This is a church for them. We do everything we can to make it exciting for them to be here at church each and every week. Our desire is to have them wake up their parents and say, I want to go to church. And uh, we are doing everything. we got a great team to help us do that. So thank you so much. We have an entire team called the Student Life Development Team that takes kids from cradle to college. And we are pouring into them, pointing them to our Heavenly Father. So if you are a new guest, we want to tell you about that and so much more. So as you leave today, if you'll step out this, the far doors to my right, your left, there's a reception room where Pastor would love to meet with you. And we have a gift that we'd love to share with you. Now before we leave, we always challenge you to be Jesus to your world. I want to just tell you how we do it with the kids. We have this great image. It's called God's Great Big Story Image. It has different images from the Bible. But then there's an image of a bunch of kids in the dark forest holding up a lantern. And that's what we are. We live in a broken world. So when we go out there and we live out the life that God's called us to be, that we're doing family the way he wants us to do, marriage the way he wants us to do, relationships the way he wants us to do it, we are shining a bright light into the darkness. So go and be Jesus to your world. Thank you all so much. You're dismissed.